Ooh, sorry. Um, if you, you guys are all really nice, friendly people. If you have a gap next to you, to your left on this side or right on that side, if you could squeeze up a bit um, in case, uh, give people a chance who are standing to sit down and that sort of thing, that would be great. And just turn to the person you're sitting next to and say, hello, who are you? Yeah, excellent. That's, that's the spirit. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, this, uh, I'm going to do a quick, I'm going to start off with a quick poll because I like interactivity. And as uh, uh, ha Andrew Harmel Law mentioned in the last uh, session, I've just come from two days of uh, unconference where everybody talks to everybody else. So I kind of like the interactivity thing. So um, who came just because the monads word was in the title? Who really doesn't understand monads? Who's a little bit afraid of monads? Okay, you can be honest. Honestly, who's a little bit afraid of monads? Oh, there's even less hands went up. Okay. Um, right, so we're going to talk about them today. Um, one of the things I really want to do is demystify these things uh, today. I don't know. There is this thing called the curse of the monads. I constantly try and break it. I don't know if I have yet. Uh, the curse of the monads basically states that once you understand them, you are suddenly rendered incapable of explaining them to other people. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I think that's a lazy answer. So I'm really going to try today. Um, but in particular, what I want you to go away with is not necessarily full uh, universal understanding of monads, but at least the idea that they are not the scary thing that you can't learn. You're already working with them. Uh, and once you've got that demystification level, you can continue your process of education. You will understand them. And when you do, you may become something that uh, sort of I'm, I'm aiming towards. Anyway, right, let me uh, go through the... This was just working a second ago. Oh, it's run out of batteries, right. Okay, never mind. I'll just do it with uh, a keyboard instead. So, and now the keyboard's not working. <laughs> Man. All right, let's try this. All right, give me a second. Come back. It is the curse. Ah, there we go. Now on my screen. Hello. Hello, little screen. Well, okay. You see, I invoked. Ah, oh, there we go. I invoked the curse of the monads, and didn't wait long enough. Two seconds. Apologies. Uh, what the hell is this doing? Right, present. Ah. Everybody have a good morning so far? <laughs> Better than mine. All right, speaker notes. Get those over here. Put that to full screen. We are back in action. I should have replaced my batteries. Right, uh, so, very quick bio. Uh, I'm Dick Wall. I used to do uh, a Java Posse, uh, a podcast called the Java Posse. Sort of still going, sort of not still going at the moment. Uh, I've been on sabbatical for a while. Um, I'm also doing the Scala Wax. Uh, I've been programming in Java. I programmed for about 15 years. Uh, about five years ago, I discovered Scala. Um, and really because it felt to me like Java hadn't moved a lot and I'd run out of opportunities to learn in Java and I started looking around for something else to learn. And so Scala came along and I'm like, this is great, there's loads to learn about this thing. Uh, and I kind of dived in and did a bunch of learning with it. Um, I, about three years ago, I've created a company with Bill Vanners uh, called Escalate Software and we do uh, training, consulting and other related paraphernalia to Scala, the Scala space specifically. Scala's in the name of Escalate. Uh, I also created an open source project called Subcut, which uh, people are telling me didn't get updated as I thought it had. So once I get through with the talk here, I need to go back and make sure that I have actually updated it for 2.11. Uh, I also contribute to various um, uh, GitHub open source projects. Most recently, I've been sort of doing stuff with Scala Z Streams, uh, which is a uh, monadic library for uh, handling data reactively, that sort of thing. Uh, interesting, interesting learning curve on that one. 
Um, Java, Posse, and Scalawax, I've mentioned. Right. Uh, and the, the title, what have the monads ever done for us? I, I love Monty Python, and uh, when I came across this, I was like, oh, yeah, got to go for the uh, what have the Romans ever done for us uh, angle. So, you know, they do a lot of things without you realizing it. And uh, so the question came up, and it says, all right, apart from the sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation roads, the freshwater system, and public health, uh, health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, they brought peace. Oh, shut up. So the point of this is, whether you know it or not, uh, you're already using, uh, probably already using monads, especially if you started using the Streams API in Java 8. You're already there. You just don't know it yet. Or maybe you do. I don't know. Uh, but the, the, the point is, these things should be invisible to you. Uh, a well-written monadic library uh, should be super simple to use, uh, very obvious, and you sh it shouldn't get up in your face at all. It's just something that, that works. Why would you care about monads? Well, if you listen to some people, they are the silver bullet right now. Uh, I've been doing this 25-odd years, which is kind of scary, and not once have I ever seen a true silver bullet in software engineering. I will 100% say they don't exist. But one thing that is pretty universal is whenever so somebody says, oh, it's a silver bullet, there's usually something there that's valuable in it. And it's worth learning just to see how it can be applied, uh, what use it has. So uh, it's another one of those. Um, got, got into it for that reason. Now, let's work up and let's start using these things. There's, when you start getting into this space, uh, there's people who would have you believe that this is all high wizardry. Uh, actually, I've seen that term used, like it's some kind of magic thing, and you've got to know the invocations and stuff. It's just words. It's just names for things. Uh, they've got to be called something. And the problem with some of these concepts is they don't have a, a handy word that fits them. So people sort of start coming up with, sometimes it's mathematical terms like this that sort of fit what you need. Uh, in the case of monads, it came from Greek philosophy, I believe, and it's like a, you know, it's this god particle unit that, uh, God knows why they called it that, but uh, anyway, you know, they had to call it something, so that was what it came up with. So let's start with something really simple. Now let's start with something called a monoid. Okay, a monoid is a really simple concept, okay? It has a starting value, something you start with, and it has a way of taking two things and combining them into one. Okay? Take out the rest of the type system stuff for now, because there are type considerations with this. You have to make the types match up as you progress these things through the system, but that's what it comes down to. Super simple example is addition. Okay? A monoid for addition is zero, because you start with the value zero, and then the operation is A, plus b. Now, if you take a list of all these things, or you know, a list of integers, and you run the monoid on them, you start from zero, then you take the first integer and you add that using the monoid combinator or the, the, the monoid combiner. And then you do the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And you get to the end, and now you have a sum of the list. And that's all it is. Now, multiplication, same thing, but you start with one. So zero is the identity for addition, one is the identity for multiplication. String concatenation, well, you know, there's various things you can do with that if you want to get fancy with make strings, but the simplest one is you start with an empty string and you just concatenate strings together. And that's a string, that's a string concatenation monoid. Uh, and then list concatenation, another one, uh, start with nil, and again, concatenate. So you start with an empty list, and you concatenate lists onto it. And I think everyone can grasp this, right? So people call them monoids, people call them zero and adder thingies. Adding isn't quite right, because you can do other kinds of things to combine them together. And that's really the, um, the concept to get from this, is any time you try and narrow it down into a simpler, narrower specification, it loses some some edge cases, which is why some of these concepts are hard to kind of get and retain. But I think anybody can get the idea of a starting value and a way of combining things, and that's a monoid. 
I should mention at this point, I haven't written any Java in about five years, not seriously. And in the lead up to this, my examples I wanted to give in Java, in Java 8. Uh, and so I went back and uh, fortunately my experience in Scala had lined me up nicely to be able to just jump straight in. And I've got to say, I absolutely love Lambdas in Java 8. They've done a great job on them. They're very clean, they fit in the language well. Uh, it was incredibly fast to take what I'd learned in Scala and transfer it across to Java. It's, uh, it's good. So these examples that we're going to see, at least until about the, the last third of the talk, are in Java. So. Just ask, they don't have to be the same types in this combination, do they? They don't have to be. So the rule of a monoid is that whatever your, um, whatever your accumulator value, there's, there's going to be an accumulator that's used, you need to target that accumulator type with the result of your function, otherwise the type system won't work out. So as you're accumulating this thing, you can take integers and turn them into a list, but every time you do that, you have to produce a list as the output so that the, the, type, uh, the type contract continues throughout the process. So yes, there are type constraints on this, um, but when you sit and think about them, when you just draw them out in your head, how would I do this? It becomes apparent that it's really kind of the only way to do it, so yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at a monoid in Java 8. Actually, this isn't even Java 8, this is just Java. If we defined an interface called monoid, uh, genericized over type T, then we'd have a start value and we'd have a combine function. Okay, just left them abstract, haven't defined them. If we want uh, an int add, then we know that our starting value is zero. And to add two things together, we take the int value and add it to the other int value, and we get an int back, or an integer in this case. Boxing does make it a bit messier. That's what you deal with, that's the, that's the way it goes. But I think you can see, starting zero, add the things together. Same thing for multiply. Now we have a, incidentally, and I want to kind of throw these concepts in there a little bit along the way. This is something, who's heard of a type class? Anyone actually, okay. This is a type class. It's a class that takes another type as a type parameter into it. And uh, these, are, oh, these are quite heavily used in functional programming, in particular in, like, well, in typed functional languages, in particular in Haskell and Scala. These are used as a way of um, doing all sorts of clever stuff. There's a kind of technique or pattern called ad hoc polymorphism. And it means you can write, and I'm going to show this in a minute, it means you can write a function that says, I'll take anything as long as one of these type classes is available to explain how to do this thing. So what we're introducing here is a monoid type class. I'm explaining how to add integers together using a monoid. Okay? Here, I explain, same thing, but now I'm doing an integer multiplication monoid type class. So instead of addition, same rough implementation, but here I start from one, which is my identity, and I multiply the numbers together. Okay, here is a generic method, bit, bit more code coming at you, but here's a generic method that takes a type class. So what we want to do, I'm going to have to use the, uh, this pointer, we want to combine a list of items of type T, okay, all these generics, lots of uh, repeated generics, but we want to combine a list of items of type T, and we can do that as long as a monoid is supplied for that type T. We don't care what the monoid is. It could be addition, it could be multiplication. We can do all sorts of different, um, uh, different things for that. Uh, and here's the implementation. First of all, if the items is empty, then we just return the monoid start value. Okay, very easy. We have to give a value back. We have a zero value or a start value. That's what we give if we have an empty list. Otherwise, we get, the item, we get the first item, and then for the rest of the list, I'm keeping it very simple. It's not the most functional code in the world, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, one of the little secrets that you see, uh, if you ever look at this, you know, Scala's a pretty functional language. Look at the collections implementations in there. You'll see while loops in there, because while loops are wicked fast. And, uh, you know, as long as that mutability doesn't escape anywhere, it's kind of like the tree falling in the forest. Does anybody, you know, does it make a sound if there's no one around to hear it? 
Uh, should the else clause also use the start value somewhere? No, because the else gets the first item of the list. We know it's not empty by that stage. So if it's not empty, we know we have at least one value. That's going to be the value. Uh, and if there's the rest of the list, then it will combine the rest of the list in. OK, so that's just my implementation. I would, if I was doing this for real, write it in a nice recursive way because I'm offering myself up for ridicule uh, in, the, in the functional world by doing, you know, by not using recursion when I could. So it's just a, a little thing. But, you know, this is simple code. It works. It solves the problem. Now I can show my mono, uh, monoid sorry, being used. So now I can say, here's a list. Got a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I just, these definitions I just put in a, uh, a thing that I can create an instance of so that you can see them. And then down here, oh, yeah, that's the, um, oh, that's, sorry, that's the function. Obviously, you've got to have the function defined somewhere. So I just created this thing called monads demo impulse, and that's got the function in it. Now I can say combine list, and I give it the list, but I have to give it the monoid that I want it to use for that type. So now I just create a new int add monoid, and I pass that in, and I've got addition. I use the same function with a list and an int mult monoid, and I get a different answer. I get the, the result of multiplying all those numbers together. OK, what about strings? So here's the string one, just to show that it still works. It's all nice and generic. And we have a start with an empty string, and we concatenate them together. Call that same way, but now I give it an array, uh, sorry, a list of str strings and a string concatenation monoid, and it concatenates them together. So what this is, this is a whole class of um, development that you see used quite a lot, which is moving towards more generic programming in the whole. Uh, you, you know, you're actually splitting up all of these problems. You're splitting up the, the collection part from the accumulation part, from the function that's going to do something with them. Now you've got these three different parts that you can plug in different, you know, different pieces together and get different results without writing more code. Uh, and if you really want to get into this, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, uh, blog posts about scrap your boilerplate and stuff like that. And that's really what you're doing is take the problem apart, split it into the smallest pieces, and start to recombine them in different ways. OK, so now we've got another fancy name, a functor. Functor. OK, you can think of a functor for now. It's the simplest thing is to think of it as roughly a transformer of things. OK, what a functor allows you to do is, given that it has something in it, uh, container I'm, at this point, it's probably worth talking about the uh, the container metaphor. Uh, when people are learning uh, functors, um, monoids, uh, sorry, monads, and so on, it really helps to think of these things being something that contains something else. And it's actually a good uh, analogy that will take you pretty much everywhere you need to go. There will come a point that suddenly you realize they're not really that thing. When you're at that point, the job is done. So, <laughs> You know, you've actually reached the, the level of enlightenment that takes you beyond this. You know, I'm not worried about you at that point. For now, you can think of these things as smart containers. Okay? They're containers that know how to do things to their contents. All right. So, roughly speaking, a transformer, you can map a function over the contents of that, uh, that item, that, that thing, that smart container. Uh, what you care about, it has a map method. Okay, the map method takes a function, which now you have in Java 8. You've got lambdas in Java 8. So you can pass a function in to a list, and you can have that function applied to all of the items of the list. Uh, if you're good um, functional citizens, it will produce a new list rather than changing the one that's there in place. Uh, and if you can start to think like that and do that, your life will get better, I promise. I, I can you know, give you many examples of why that is, but immutability is good. It helps you reason about a lot of stuff. It helps you get to the things that you want to try and get to, parallelism and so on. All right, so we're going to look at a dead simple list implementation. This is not intended. There are people who are here who are going to pull me up on 
uh, or who could pull me up on everything, most specifically performance. This is a dreadfully performing implementation. Uh, but it demonstrates the concepts really well. So I'm going to create a dead simple list. And my dead simple list uh, of type T, I also skip the whole wildcards thing. That's a whole dimension I just don't want to deal with in this talk. Uh, all it does is muddies up the slides. So everything is invariant. Okay, Everything is just that type. So our dead simple list has a map function, or a, a, yeah, a map method on it. It takes a function from T to another type of U. That's the function. And uh, returns, so we start with a dead simple list of T. We return a dead simple list of U, OK, by applying that function from U to T over all the items. Have I lost anyone yet? No? You, you can admit to it, really. I'd rather not lose you at this stage, or the rest of it's going to be hard. All right, so yeah, you get the idea. Function from T to U, apply it to everything in a list, you get a, a list of U. Apply it to everything in a list of T, you get a list of U. And because I just want to show this concept, there's another concept coming up, which is very heavily used in uh, monoids and uh, functors and all of this stuff. Uh, this is the basis of something called an algebraic data type. Uh, these are also heavily used in uh, functional programming. And what an algebraic data type is, is a super type, usually abstract, completely abstract, with a finite number of, usually a fairly small number, of implementations underneath it. And Scala in particular has, and so does Haskell, have uh, some advantages of being able to let you keep the superclass public, inherit from it in a controlled way, but then stop anybody else inheriting from it. And that's kind of crucial, because otherwise, somebody else sometime is going to come along and add a new superclass, that, oh, sorry, subclass that you're not expecting, and it could completely screw up all of your code, because now, you know, you've, oh, as you'll see in a minute, with list, you have either an empty, an empty list or a non-empty list, uh, an item, followed by another list. If somebody comes along and adds some completely new thing, you don't know how to cope with it anymore. And I don't know that there's a good answer for that in Java 8 yet. Yes? Um, is there any reason to use an abstract class on an interface? No, not really, actually. I think that's probably a habit I've picked up from Scala with traits. Uh, it's an evil uh, pre-optimization that you shouldn't do, but abstract classes are ever so slightly faster than traits in Scala. So sometimes you, uh, you use them. And I think it's probably just a habit that I've brought from there. Uh, so anyway. Is empty is defined, it just returns a boolean. And then contents of string is just so that we can see the result of running this thing. That's pretty much all this thing does. All right, implementations. Nil. Nil is an empty list. It's a terminator for all lists. I could have made it a singleton, but again, more boilerplate that doesn't really matter. I don't care about it. But the important things are dead simple list, OK? What do you get if you map a function over an empty list? Empty list? Pretty obvious, right? It's, it's clear. So there's our implementation right there. We start with a dead simple list of t, and we have a map. We have to satisfy this map function, or this map method, to return a dead simple list of u. If we start with a nil, we end up with a nil. Simple. OK, another nice thing. This is lovely about al algebraic data types. Is a nil empty? Yes, it's always empty. So, so that's just true, <laughs> OK? Our implementation there is just true. And the contents as a string, well, we're just going to print out nil for that, uh, for no other reason than, you know, we've got to print something out and nil seems to work. OK, a non-nil, very simply, is an item followed by another list, OK? That other list could be a further item or it could be nil. OK, so this is the simplest uh, data structure you can think of. Linked list, it's immutable. Uh, at least it is as long as the contents are immutable. And so what we have is a constructor that takes an item and then a tail, which is the rest of the list. And then the rest of that could be nil. So if we have a, a, a list of one thing, we have a list of an item, and the tail of it is nil. If we have a list of two things, we have an item followed by an item followed by a nil, and so on. Is a list with an item empty? No, so that's false. <laughs> really simple, huh? And then 
The contents as a string is just simply to return the head as the string, plus something to indicate that we've got following stuff, plus the tail as contents, you know, a two string basically. And the double colon there is just a convention that functional languages use a lot to show. Uh, it's called the cons operator. This, this, uh, and you can see dead simple list cons there. The construction of a list is basically creating a list and then creating a new node and sticking that existing list into the tail of it. All right, so here's the support code for that. To get numbers, uh, it's not the prettiest implementation from a use point of view, but we can construct a list of 10 things by, um, we're adding to the head, so in order to get 1 to 10, I have to work backwards. Okay, we start from the tail, we go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Then when you traverse the list, you go from the start and you get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, nil. And that's what that's doing. So that's here, start at 10, down to 0, or down to 1. And then we, co we cons it by keeping a running, running list of the nums and adding to the beginning of it. And I've got a function in here, which I didn't want to just do a function that goes from a number to a number because I want to show that when you have these map operations to type inside of the, uh, of the container, uh, of the functor, can change. So I've also got one that takes, given an int, returns a number of stars in a string of that many. Okay, So that's a, that's a type change. Here it is in use. We get our numbers, 1 to 10. We can do the print contents of string, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, nil. Now we can do a map, nums.map, x goes to x times x. Okay, now we've got the squares from 1 to 10. Squares of the numbers from 1 to 10. And then we can do the stars conversion that I was showing before. This is the uh, method, method reference syntax. And uh, so we just say nums, map, and then we map the number of stars function. And it, now what we get back is a dead simple list of string rather than a dead simple list of in integer. All right, all good so far. So that is a functor. It has a map method. may not be called a map method. Traditionally, it is. But as you'll see later, the, um, what is it called? The completable future in uh, Java 8 is also a functor and a monad, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, but it doesn't call these, these methods map and flat map. It calls them async compose and async Oh, I've got them written down on the slide, I think, but uh, we'll get there in a minute. But they're just different names. What you really want to look at with these things is the type signatures, uh, because it's pretty obvious when you, do, when you have something that says, I take myself of type T, and I return myself of type U, chances are you've got a map operation, the functor operation. OK, so here's the thing. It's not just lists. In fact, lists are... Everybody's used to lists, everybody's used to collections by this stage. And mapping things over a list or a collection is pretty obvious. But this concept, you know, the generic programming thing again, there's nothing about this concept that says this only works for collections. Okay? The first one, the simplest one, and this is from the Java 8 libraries, but with the wildcards removed, because again, they kind of made things a bit ugly, so I just pulled them out for now, um, is optional. And most people start to think of optional as a box, like a collection, with either nothing in it or something in it. So it's like a collection of maximum one things. That's a good analogy to get you going. But really, optional is just a type. It's just a functor that has a map method on it. If you map over something that has an item in it, it applies the function to that, and it gives you back a new type of itself with the changed contents. And if you map over nothing, what do you think you get? <coughs> nothing. Just like if you start with a nil, you end up with a nil. If you start with a nothing, you end up with a nothing. That's a pretty simple concept. Optional is a really good functor and monad to start learning this. In fact, if you really want to get the kind of idea down and gain some confidence, go and write optional. I actually say this at the end. Go and write optional or option for yourself. Write some tests, prove that it works, and then throw it away because your version's not going to be as good as the one in the Java libraries. They've thought this stuff through. And, you know, just you write this stuff, throw it away, just try it out and experiment. All right, now there's this other thing, though. It's not just map, there's this other method in optional, and it's called flat map. Now, so far we've dealt with map, 
takes a function from t to u and gives you back one of itself with a u in it instead of a t. What if you have a function, okay, if we call ourselves thingy, I was going to use m, but that's the classic thing and it starts to look like alphabet soup. So if we're thingy and we, ha we are a thingy of t, we, we take a function now, instead of going from t to u, we take a function that goes from t to a thingy of u. Same, same thing as we are. Okay, if we were to map that over, anybody want to take a wild stab? There's no shame in trying and failing. What would be the return type of a map if we mapped the function from t to thingy of u over ourselves? Yes, I heard it. It's a thingy of thingy of u. And so if you do this with an option, and you do it five times, you end up with option, 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 that was four, option, x, or u, okay? That's not very useful, because now you've got all this unpacking to do. So what flat map does is very carefully retains our thinginess, our nature around the whole thing, but gets rid of the inner ones as we move along it, okay? You can pretty well see, and I'll, I've got a little diagram in a minute, but you can pretty well see that for option, there's a really clear path. If you start from a none, and you apply anything to it, you end up with a none. If you start with something, but your function ends up with a none, what would you expect to get out of that? A none, right. If your function takes, you know, we've got something, if your function takes that something and returns a something of that, you would expect to get a something of that back. Not a something of something, but a something. So these are really easy semantics to, to grasp, right? And it's flat map. Flat map's a terrible name for this thing. Uh, it's also probably the best one that I've seen, because they're all terrible names for this thing. <laughs> I've never seen a good name. It's really the, well, do something with the insides based on the function that's coming in and our actual contents, and then give a meaningful result with our nature back again. That's rather a long function name to have. So, you know, flat map actually describes the operation. Uh, bind is what's used in Haskell to describe the same thing. I'm not sure I can come up with a convincing reason for it to be called bind. I'm sure somebody who's a, a Haskell person will probably come up with exactly the reason it's called bind. But it has to have a name in order to, you know, be called. So flat map is what we end up with. This is what I was just, ju just saying. This is the, um, the diagram. So if we start here with a null, oh, sorry, a none, we end up with a none. If we start with something, but our function goes to a none, we end up with a none. And if we start with something, and our function goes to a something, these boxes are the thingy, the thinginess, so we end up with a boxed B out of it, then we end up just with a boxed B. Okay. Is this a concept everybody's got down? I've been laboring it rather hard. Um, next slide. Next slide, I promise. I'm, I'm almost there. So, uh, yes, you, yeah. Uh, so, you don't have a flat map in a functor. A functor is dependent on a map. Okay? When you have a flat map in something, that makes it a monad. Okay? That's the monad y nature of the thing. Um, the monad does not have to have a map, actually. But usually you'll find that the two go hand in hand. You don't often see flat map implemented without map, so you end up with a functor that is also a monad, basically. Um, now, I haven't talked about the rules deliberately. I will hit on the rules at the end, uh, and I'm going to get into that very subtle thing. But for now, we're doing well, okay? I think I've got everybody on the, uh, you know, on the page. So, other flat map implementers, okay? In, in uh, Scala, at least, all of the lists and collections have maps and flat maps defined. It's not true in Java, but Java has something I, I have to say is at least as good, if not better, which is the Streams API, which, having used it, is really good. You guys need to learn the Streams API. It's fantastic. They've done a great job on that. And, and guess what's in there? There's a map and a flat map. We'll see them in a minute. OK. Uh, futures. Futures do this. Now, here's that subtle difference, OK? Up until now, Lists and collections, they really are 
boxes of things. They've got stuff in them. The thing with the future is it's not necessarily really there yet. Okay? This is where the mind twist happens. Future is something that's happening off somewhere else. At some point, it could produce a result, or it may not. You may have it yet, or you may not. You don't know. But you have a map and a flat map on it. So you can take things that are in the future, and you map functions over them, and they become a future of that new thing without blocking. Okay? They don't wait. This is, uh, this is possible because functions are just data. So a naive implementation, uh, one that will do for your homework to you know, sort of start messing with this stuff, is you say, oh, I'll grab that function that's running, and on success, I'll run that function on the successful value that comes back. It's a, an event. You know, the event comes in, oh, I've got a success. Let's run that function, and then run this other function, and then run this other function, and you queue all the work up without blocking. Flat map, even more excitingly, takes something that takes your item and returns another future of that item and collapses it down to a single future. Okay, so now you can go out to a web page, you can do a lookup of your lat longs from a, from a web service based on your postcode, and then you can look up the temperature based on your lat longs. Both of those things will, hopefully, if you've written them right, return a future result from some web service somewhere. But the result of your overall thing is a future of temperature. Okay, it's collapsed it all down. And that's where this is useful. It's, oh, there's so many different ways this is described. TypeSafe is nuts on calling this um, reactive programming, and it is. It's reactive. It's never, ever blocking. Uh, it's using these functions together to you know, streamline this operation of things that you will do. And the other beauty of it is, all of the questions about, well, what happens when things go wrong, typically are handled by the writer of the monad, the, the functor monad. Okay, so if you think about it, on success, you provide the happy path, the, the result bumps through the system when it's ready, and you get your happy result at the end of it. If an exception occurs along the way, it's up to the, the creator of the functor or monad to decide what to do with it, but a pretty good... Uh, you know, possibility is the first exception that occurs. You just carry that through as a failure to the end, right? You don't try and do the rest of the work. It, that might, that may be. You may try and recover, and then you start getting into really fancy, you know, try recovery uh, situations. And you can program all this sort of in this little. Well, here's my script of things to do. And you know, maybe if I get a division by zero, I can try and recover and do it, or maybe if the web service doesn't answer the first time, I can try and recover by calling it again, and those kind of things. So you can provide that all in one thing that never ever blocks. It never waits for this stuff to happen. It's just got, well, here's my plan B and my plan C, and you know, can I get a result at the end of it? Try and uh, try with a capital T is something that's available in uh, Scala, I think as of 2.10. Uh, and strictly speaking, it's not a monad, but you know what? It has a map and a flat map, and that's really the part that matters for what you guys are interested in right now. I will mention the monad laws at the end if we get a, if we get a moment. But uh, th these are the ones that you'll see, that you'll probably start to use. Most, most of you will use the Java 8 streams as the you know, kind of first, first hit on this stuff, and they are fantastic. You'll love using the streams. Uh, very reactive, doesn't block anywhere. The whole thing is setting up all these things to happen, and out pops a result or a failure at the end of it. And, you know, uh, somebody else has done all that clever work for you. And they're running on, you know, multiple processes and cores and all that stuff. It's, it's great. So somebody's done that. And then, w there should have been a star after this one. You can roll your own. Now there's, there be dragons. So, uh, you know, uh, definitely roll your own. Get used to doing it. Don't overuse this. Uh, that, I, think, I think I'm going to issue a warning at the end of this to, to that uh, effect. But, okay, let's have a look at the Java 8 streams. Uh, so here is an example of Java 8 streams. You take a list, you do a stream on it, just call stream. Suddenly this thing isn't really a list anymore. It's actually quite a, quite a clever... Com um, I kind of dived into the source code and I'm like, wow, this is going to take me a while to internalize and understand exactly what they did. I assume it works, because it's been well tested, and I'm sure they've got it right. They've had plenty of time to do it. The nice thing is I don't really have to know. 
Well, I kind of do if it does go wrong, but then I'm just going to submit a bug and get them to fix it. Okay, somebody else's problem. Uh, but uh, an example. So now we say, okay, filter. I haven't really talked about filter, but pretty clear what filter does. Filter takes. There's another name, uh, one that's not nearly as shocking, called predicate. And predicates are a class of function that takes some value and always returns a boolean. Okay, that's just a predicate. And predicates can be fed to things like filter and has all you know all. What is it for all? For each exists. All those things can take. Uh, predicates and they do some something based on taking that predicate. So we filter out only the even numbers, okay? We map the square function over it, and then we do a reduce. Now, what does that reduce look like to anyone there? A monoid, yeah.、Uh, we, it's not a formal monoid, you know. It's just, but it's got a starting value, and it has a combinator、uh, or a combiner function. So that's our, you know, that's our nice little thing. So now. What we end up with is a, at the end of this is a stream. Actually, the reduce turns it into a real value again, but、um, we end up kind of streaming over this thing and end up with the sum of the even squares from one to ten. So two, four, six, eight, ten added together, which turns out to be two twenty. What about if we, instead of just mapping the value directly over, what, we, what if we want to sum all of the combinations? Of one to ten, by one to ten. So we want to multiply. We want to do the times tables on everything, and sum up the result. Well, what we can do for that is we've got a function for that. It's called flat map. Flat map retains our, our outer thinginess, our outer listiness, but gets rid of the inner one. So what we do is we say flat map,、uh, flat map or list dot stream flat map of i. Then we create, or we take the, street, the list again.、It、doesn't actually have to use that i as the creator of the other thing that we're doing. That's a really important point. The the list that we create doesn't have to depend on the list that we start with. It could be another list entirely. It's types that matter, but they're both lists. So we do a flat map over it, and that one we flat map it, and we take the i times the j. So we end up, we don't end up with a list of lists. From one to ten times one to ten, we end up with a list of all the one to tens times the one to tens, the whole matrix of values. But it's all been straightened out into one thing, and then we reduce them with a sum operation at the end. Okay, so that's a flat map in use. Good so far. How am I doing? Ten minutes? No, twenty minutes. Good, excellent. I think we have time for the demo. Okay, so the optional,、uh, same thing. Uh, as the streams that we just saw, doing the flat map. But if we have, let's say, an optional result,、uh, all by all of、uh, the value that we just had, optional can have either something in it or none in it. So I've got three values here. I've got the result that we have. I've got a doubler, like the number two, sum of two, and I've got a not there, basically a none in here. It's not not there. What I can do is safely say. Optional result flat map, and I stick that into value n1. Doubler map n2, stick that into value n2. Now I can do n1 times n2 without worrying about whether I've got to check if they're none or sum or anything like that. You can think at this point they've been unpacked, they've been pulled out from the the thing, and you know that map and flat map know how to cope with nones being in there. Okay. Pretty much any time with option, it's really easy. Any time a none comes into the mix with option, you end up with a none anywhere along the chain, quite safely. Okay. And if everything is not a none, you end up with the result that you're expecting in an option still. So there's an example. So the first one will actually produce sum of、uh, I don't know six o fifty or something like that. Three o two five times two. The second one. Will produce none because the not there, when you map over it, produces none. That's the result. And the last one, when we're flat mapping over a none, that results in a none. So you can see how these things now compose together and produce a safe result that makes sense, regardless of whether you give it something or not. How am I doing? Anyone lost yet? Wow. No, that can't be true. Somebody's lost, and they're just not admitting to it. 
I don't believe it, but what the hell? Let's boogie up. All right, so I, I, again, I'll say going back into Java 8 was really fun doing this. It's amazing the difference just adding lambdas in makes to my attitude towards the language. Suddenly, there's new stuff to learn again, and that's, that's phenomenal. But I'm going to switch to Scala now, because I'm really used to Scala. And for a lot of these things, there's actually a lot, a lot more clarity. Uh, you know, lots of people are very, well, Scala's really hard to understand. I want you to look at this code. This is very typical code. Wow, five minutes left. Oh, my god. Is that true? 50 minutes. Yeah, OK. I better boogie. Um, right, five minutes left. Uh, so uh, Scala code looks almost identical to the streams code we just saw. And this is very typical Scala code. Okay? So what you saw before in the way of saying Scala is very complicated, I think what you were actually seeing was Scala is very unfamiliar. And the Streams API looks very familiar to me coming from a Scala uh, background. I think, it will, I think it, that will work uh, the, the same way. We've got a, a filter map and fold left. Fold left is just the same as reduce in the other one. Uh, you can see it has a starting value and a function from you know, two things to one thing. Uh, it's just a different name for it. You know, names, what are you going to do? Uh, and the second one is the flat map. Scala option, same kind of thing we saw before. Opt result flat map, using a map, a doubler map. Uh, down the bottom there, I did one that's a little bit more involved. It actually puts all three of them together. I got a bit fancy. So we flat map over the first one, we flat map over the second one, and we map over the last one. And you end up with actually none in this case, but if all three of them had something in, you'd end up with some of a number in there. Now, give me some sugar, baby. Uh, Scala's 4 is something that Java doesn't have. I don't know if they'll get it. Uh, I'd like to think maybe somebody at least someday would consider they might. But what 4 does is it pretties up those chained expressions for you. Uh, and it does it through rewriting the code using simple compile time rules to exactly the same code you just saw. So here's an example of those two things that I just did written in four comprehensions instead. So you say for, for n from numbers, if n percent 2, or you know, mod 2 equals equals 0, yield n times n. And then dot sum is a convenience on there. It's a reducer that's defined to be a monoid of 0 and plus. And then that's the really sweet part. The second one is for n1, from nums, n2 from nums, yield n1 times n2 sum. Okay? The rules are every statement in there that's a from, the, the left pointing arrow, gets turned to a flat map except the last one, which gets turned into a map, which is what we saw on the other ones. You do flat map, flat map, flat map, flat map, map. Okay? And then the if turns into a filter, or a with filter, strictly speaking, but you get the idea. Okay. Using, f using options, I'm going to skip right to the last one. Very beautiful, suddenly. So now you say, if I've got an n1, an n2, and an n3, yield n1 times n2 times n3. If any of those are none, I just end up with a none at the end of it. All right. And the future. And this is the future. I, I was hoping to get to demo, but if you catch me later, I'll uh, show this. This is how you use futures in the same thing. So you go out and you create a future that gets the current value in US dollars and the current value in uh, Swiss francs. Why did I use that? I can't remember. Probably because I thought I was at um, uh, Scala Days next week. And what you can now do is, get, is use those quotes, even though they're futures. And if it's profitable, you create a, you do another connection and buy some of that money. Okay. Very simple trading program. If you get rich off of this, I think I'm due 10% from <laughs> the, having the idea in the first place or something. But anyway, yeah. The thing about this is purchase doesn't block at all, OK? Because of the nature of what we've seen so far, you end up with a future of a buy order, a possible buy order. Nothing in there blocks at any point. And then we can say down at the bottom, on success, print purchased amount of uh, Swiss francs. All right, try. Um, I haven't really got time to go through this. Suffice to say that there are both monoid and monad laws, which you can read about on Wikipedia. Uh, strictly speaking, try is not a monad. However, you can use it in exactly the same way. And what you care about is really that you can flat map and map over it. And that's, I think, where you need to start letting go of the whole Ooh, mystical monads thing. 
These things can be useful just because they have a map and a flat map on them. And these conventions work. As you go through the try process, you can recover and things like that. And you can get a result or not get a result based on their semantics. OK, sadly, I don't have time for the demo, which I worked really hard on yesterday as well. But like I said, if you catch me later, I'll show that. So in summary, um, monads are very useful. You're using them already, whether you know it or not. Um, there is a tendency to overuse them on problems. You will use them as a client all the time. But beware of writing everything in the world as a monad. There is that thing. I like to talk of myself as a post-monadist in the same way that uh, uh, painters became post-modernists. Um, it's like I've been there, I've done that, and I realized that they have some real use, but they can be horribly overused. And in particular, they don't mix very well. So if you end up with all these different monads coming together, it can make a very complicated result. So try and use the ones that are built in. All right, q and I'm out of time, but I guess I don't know what the rules are, whether it's super strict q and A. Uh, it's only lunchtime, right? Well, I'll, I'll be standing here, so if you want to come and ask me questions, that's fine too. Uh, so thank you very much for, for coming, and hopefully that's demystified them for you.